That's my voice. <laughs> okay. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome. Um, my name is Neil Yosha. My talk is Black Energy Power. It's going to be a story about a power grid hack and uh, kind of going step by step. Anyone like stories? Okay. Most of you, if not all of you. So that's great. Uh, before we start, just a little bit about myself. Um, I'm originally from Israel. Um, I used to serve in the Israeli army in the intelligence corps. I cannot tell you much more about it or I have to kill you. But um, I moved here to the U.S. 15 years ago and uh, worked for multiple vendors, specifically in user behavior analytics and threat intelligence. I also worked in a SCADA networks, uh, which is relevant for our story today. Just uh, by a raise of a hand, uh, which one of you is uh, actively working in threat intelligence? Which one of you has threat intelligence uh, teams within the organization? Okay, some of you. All right, so that, that's a good audience for me to kind of uh, hopefully uh, help you learn one or two about uh, threat intelligence. So we'll start with the acronyms. Um, little quiz. What IOC stands for? One, two, or three, or four? Indicators of compromise. We're going to run it fast. Um, kill chain. Which uh, one is the second phase of the kill chain? Anyone? Weaponization. TTP stands for? Technic techniques, exactly. Technic techniques and procedures. Which one is not a threat intel feed? That's kind of hard, but Splunk, uh, we'll speak about that. And last question, HMI stands for, sorry? Number two, correct. By the way, we have giveaways at the end. Those with the right answers will definitely get it, but so are the others, so you're welcome to get Okay, so what we're going to do today is I'm going to tell you a story. Um, go over a little bit on those acronyms for those who are not familiar with them. I'll talk about a term called pyramid of pain and uh, tools used to investigate threat attacks. And then we'll go over specifically the Ukraine uh, power grid hack uh, step by step, how it was done, get into the technical details, um, and then talk about some conclusions, who might be behind this hack, and um, answer uh, any questions you have. By the way, I'd, I'd love to do those talks interactively. If you have any questions during the, the talk, just raise your hand um, and ask or comment or whatever. So indicators of compromise. Indicators of compromise, simply put, are artifacts within the network, either network or host, that be being somehow suggesting that there's an intrusion. So, few examples of indicators of compromise. IP addresses, URLs, emails, all of those things can help us kind of put the puzzle together and understand the attack. Who is behind the attack and where are we within the kill chain? Now, indicators of compromise are not associated to any specific security attack model. But um, here you can see a, the kill chain model as an example. A kill, kill chain model has multiple steps that attackers will go in order to successfully execute the hack. Each one of those indicators can be associated and collected either by computers or human being uh, to, the, to the kill chain. So for example, IP address could be related to command and control server. Uh, MD5 could be the hash value of the malware. Uh, email address could be related to the delivery method, and so on and so forth. And so those help us to understand the kill chain. And I'll show you um, in my talk today a specific incident and how we can walk the, the kill chain uh, using the indicators. Pyramid of pain. I, I, by the way, I heard it in some other talk. Someone was calling it pyramid of pain. Why does, what is pyramid? Pyramid of pain is trying to aggregate all those indicators, okay, and put them into kind of buckets. Um, the bottom are hash values, IP addresses. They are relevantly, uh, relatively, sorry, 
um, simple indicators. You go higher the pyramid, you get into domains and infrastructure based, such as network and host. Those are more sophisticated. And at the top, you have tools like malware pieces and TTP, like I mentioned earlier, standing for tactic, techniques, and procedures, which is basically a behavioral indicators. Those are trying to identify the adversaries. Who are they? What are their motivations? Uh, what's the methodology? And what's the mode of operation? Now, the reason it's called pyramid of pain is because the higher you go on this pyramid, the harder it is to provide countermeasures. So for example, hash values, it's relatively easy to block today using endpoints. You can create signatures for specific MD5. Uh, but it's also easy for the adversary to change a hash, hash value of a malware just by adding a little bit of a code into it, right? Same thing with IP address. IP addresses are relatively easy to change for the attackers, but also relatively to block for the defender. If you go higher, it's harder, and you go into tools and TTPs, it, it's much harder for the attackers to change the actual malware they're using. But it's also very hard for us, the inventors, to identify those pieces. And that's why they call it the pyramid of pain. It's painful the more you get higher in the pyramid. So like in any other investigation, and by the way, I like to, I like to see cyber investigations just like any other crime investigation, like a murder case. You have a detective, you have evidence, you have a suspect, and you're trying to find who murdered, where, where's the body, and who, who is the, uh, the killer. And so the tools we're using, obviously, as you know, sandboxes for malware, a network analyzer to identify lateral movements and, and uh, communication back into C2, uh, and any other observables such as password, keywords, DLLs, configuration file, registries keys, all of those helping kind of to put all those pieces together and solve the mystery. Now, if you don't have all the information, you can use what we call enrichment tools. What's enrichment tools? Enrichment tools are external repositories like VirusTotal and others that already have some history uh, related to a piece of malware or an IP address, and you can add information and get more context around the evidence that you find on the scene. Log files. Log files from your environment can help you cross-correlate the information from the outside sources. And outside sources could be vendors, <clears throat> either commercial or open source, that send you indicators that are additional kind of information you can look at to those uh, indicators you gathered by yourself. Make sense? Great. So let's look at the specific in incident that we're going to investigate today. Uh, the, inv the incident happened in Ukraine. Uh, it was a power grid that um, the, the incident uh, happened at uh, December 23rd, 2015. You can see here a brief description, uh, but three main points that I want to clarify is that this is the first time in history that someone brings down a power grid. First cyber attack that creates a power outage and gets power out of citizens. It's very coordinated. Uh, this specific operation uh, was three different sites going down at the same time simultaneously, in addition to a call center, a power grid call center that was attacked as well. And lastly, the impact, 225,000 people lost their power. So let's start going down the pyramid of pain. Remember? Starting from the top, tactics. What is the tactic? Obviously, in our case, is going after critical infrastructures. In our case, it's electricity. Um, and bringing down the power. The question is why? And to answer that question, there's another pyramid. I like pyramids, by the way. <laughs> uh, it's called the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Anyone familiar with that? Great, so a lot of people are familiar. So, um, as, as some of you know, this one tried to kind of match the motivation, what motivates people, 
with their needs. And at the bottom of the pyramid, there are the critical basic needs of people, such as food, water, and electricity. And so obviously, uh, the attackers were after a basic need. Um, and I, I claim that it's not only the power, but also the security and safety of people uh, that uh, was compromised. Because when you're after uh, a power and, and people don't really know what's going on, they're also insecure and, and it's, uh, it's basically attacking the, their safety. Uh, in order to understand the techniques, how this was done, um, I need to talk a little bit about what we call ICS, which stands for Industrial Control Systems. Anyone familiar with that? Okay, great, again. Um, this one is a general term for uh, control systems in the production industry and critical infrastructure industry that includes multiple pieces such as PLCs, which stand for programmable logic controllers, and RTUs, which are remote telemetry units, that are the glue between the equipment in production or in critical systems. In our case, it's going to be turbines, uh, breakers, uh, transformers. That's the hardware piece and the computing network. And so in order to take off the power, it is critical to, for the hackers to understand how ICS networks work. Now HMI, remember from a little quiz, stands for Human Machine Interface. And this is how it looks like. Basically, there is an operator sitting in a power grid and has control on the turbines and the breakers. They can manually turn off some of them, turn on the others, and basically monitoring uh, the process. Unfortunately, the protocols are very proprietary within this world, and multiple vendors have different protocols and uh, different applications, so it's, from a security perspective, very hard to monitor and, and make sure uh, there's no uh, intrusion into those systems. In other terms, within this um, kind of world is SCADA. Um, SCADA systems are the, uh, again, general term for all those computers uh, and networks behind uh, this uh, environment. And you can see here that there are multiple layers uh, that the attackers had to go through. Uh, they're starting from a, an external network. Unfortunately, this one was not air-gapped, but there was a VPN uh, that was about was supposed to protect the the SCADA network as well as Ethernet to serial communication line, and the attackers had to go through multiple layer before they ended up at the HMI stations, which has the capability to create this power outage. Okay, so going down the pyramid of pain, we're looking at tools now, and the main tool used within uh, the Ukraine power grid attack is black energy. Anyone familiar with black energy? Yeah. So black energy is a relatively old malware family uh, that has involved, evolved even uh, through the years. And the story of black energy starts in 2007. At that time, it was a very simple Trojan specifically used for denial of services attack. Uh, moving on, 2010, uh, Black Energy version 2 uh, was a much more sophisticated piece of malware. And at that point, it has capabilities for bank fraud and spamming. And then the piece we're going to investigate today is Black Energy 3. That's the one that has been used on the uh, Ukraine power grid attack. That specific one has a modular architecture it has plugins that he can load, and each plugin has a specific function within the kill chain, and we'll go into details there. Also, Black Energy 3 has multiple ways to be installed, uh, including a dropper, uh, just a simple DLL, or uh, as part of an application, malicious installation. The second tool used in this attack is kill disk. Uh, kill disk, like the name suggests, is uh, main purpose is to wipe out a hard drive. And the reason it has been used during this attack was uh, twofold. First, to remove any evidence 
in other words, to kill the, uh, the black energy piece and, and other evidences. Second, to render the uh, SCADA network unusable. So the attacker's idea is that after we make the attack, we will make sure power cannot be restored from the SCADA network. From a host perspective, uh, the attacker um, demonstrated variety of capabilities. Uh, there were two main methods for them to actually access uh, the SCADA host. The first one is they managed to steal credentials, okay? And after they stole the credentials, they managed to create a VPN tunnel to the, um, the SCADA network. And at this point, they can recreate a remote desktop a session, just like, uh, you know, you guys using a remote desktop RDP or TeamViewer, th they can just see the HMI and operate, uh, whether, you know, operate as a remote user. And the second one is, uh, they crafted a customized malicious firmware and injected it within the SCADA network to one of the PLCs so they would be able to execute what they want to execute and render the uh, SCADA network unusable. Now, in parallel, you can see here on the top, the black energy piece kept on maintaining persistence and communicated back and forth into the command and control. So you see that there's, uh, you know, few uh, redundancies on their communications that uh, they kind of uh, have more than one uh, backdoor they, they could have used. So far, so good? Any questions? All right, so I need to start speaking slower. I'm not sure I have 50 minutes to talk. Um, kidding, I will make it. So now we're getting into those pieces of evidence, the small ones. Uh, domains, IP addresses, those are the basic indicators. And just as an example, this is an IP address taken from the site. And there's a couple of things you can learn from an IP address. First of all, you can learn the geolocation. So we found out that this is in uh, the west side of Ukraine. But then you can look at uh, domain tools and find out what was the domain associated with that specific IP address at the time of the attack. And it, uh, it turns out to be a, a list of domains, uh, one of which was a gov.ua domain, which suggests that this specific uh, attacker was after Ukraine government, gov uh, for government and ua for Ukraine. The other thing we can do with an IP address is to use a threat intelligence platforms and enrichment tools, like, like I mentioned earlier, like VirusTotal, and now we're starting to get a better understanding of what these IP addresses are associated with. For example, in our case, uh, part of the kill chain is the command and control. You can see here kind of a circle of all the attributes. Black energy, as expected, is the associated malware piece to that IP. Uh, you, you can find out what uh, historically the ports has been used with that IP address uh, and other attributes and uh, related indicators. This is a very interesting um, visual that uh, we found on one of those variants. Uh, and that spe specific variant found within the site uh, was modified to support proxy servers. Uh, the fact that someone modified the proxy server suggests that the attackers had some kind of a reconnaissance and some kind of an inside information on the fact that there is a proxy and even found the exact proxy URL that needs to be used. Now, obviously, proxy is essential for this piece of malware to communicate back into command and control, right? So, again, going on the kill chain, uh, we will see that uh, this was a very thorough thought uh, process from the at attacker perspective. So here's just a list of what have been accomplished. Additionally to stealing credential, the attackers managed to uh, create a VPN tunnel to access the HMI. They even disarmed the UPS system, so the internal computers won't have any backup once the power is out. And eventually created the final attack. So let's go over 
the kill chain step by step and see how the indicators help us uh, solve the mystery. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the kill chain process, this is a slight modification of the traditional kill chain. It's called the ICS kill chain. And it has actually two stages. The first stage has step by step what, what the traditional kill chain looks like. And the second one is the ICS attack itself. So because of this CADA uh, kind of uh, portion of it, um, there are additional steps necessary for the attackers before they can attack the, the SCADA network. And by the way, you can see here, it took six months from the very first intrusion to the actual power outage. So six months, the attacker managed to stay under the radar uh, without being uh, discovered, which is kind of scary, right? Think about it. All right, so let's go stage by stage. I'm starting with stage number one. The attacker decided to weaponize a Microsoft Office document with um, some attachment. You can see here, this is a decoy document. Obviously, it is in Ukraine. I kind of understood that this is some type of a political article. Don't speak Ukraine yet. But um, the idea is to uh, to add this one, and obviously the, the embedded malware within it will be a black energy dropper. So the delivery uh, is going to be spear phishing. So emails are being sent into personnel within the power grid uh, that I have that use the the same network, and those guys are opening it. And once they opening the attachment, they are going to be encouraged to enable a macro. Now, if they enabling a macro, this is going to compromise a uh, and exploit a specific. Uh, Microsoft vulnerability, you can see here the article of this vulnerability. And the way it works is that on that specific version, if it's not patched, it's going to allow remote embedded pieces to the PowerPoint. And you can see here on the bottom here that those pieces are coming in from an external source. Now, obviously, that, that piece of information is not an image. It's an executable, and it's the dropper for black energy. You can see here the INF file manages to change the extensions from GIF to GIF.exe. And at this point, the black energy installer has few challenges. The first one is, uh, as you know, Windows 64-bit has a validation for digital signature process. So a driver cannot be installed without a valid uh, signature. Um, unfortunately, they don't have the digital signature, so what they did is uh, the Black Energy is changing the boot configuration to allow temporary signatures. So at this point, it can install it. However, when you change this, there is this uh, um, little text on the, uh, next to the tray that says test mode. And in order to stay under the radar and make sure that this is not showing up, the uh, specific uh, b malware uh, piece we're using um, is running a patch for user 32 DLL MUI, which is a user linguistic uh, patch, and that allows them to change the text to whatever they want, and they choose to mask it out, so it's not visible. Now, the last challenge is that a UAC access control, user access control pop-up uh, will come up unless they're using some kind of an API, and they choose to use the Windows Application Compatibility API. Uh, it's a shim, that database that comes together with the, with the dropper, and at this point, they're also masking this. So everything is uh, on the background. Um, and at this point, uh, the driver has one uh, kind of a task, which is to inject the DLL into a user space process, specifically SVC host.exe. The driver doesn't have, by the way, any root kits, boot kits, it's very lean, which makes it very hazy, uh, very hard uh, to be detected. Even if you have uh, root kit scanners, you won't find it. And at this point, it looks for a disabled driver, available the server disabled driver, replace it with the malicious one, and start it. Add it into the registry, and Windows takes care of the rest. And at this point, uh, the DLL is up and running.
Okay, we're here. So the DLL, the main DLL itself is useless for the attackers because it has, like I mentioned earlier, a modular architecture. It doesn't really have any functionalities. And so at this point, the main DLL can use a list of a library of plugins. And each plugin has different type of capabilities. And you can see here a few of them. Uh, password stealers, screenshot takers, uh, update malwares, um, the destroy system one, which is the, the, the kill disk. Um, and the, the upload is pretty simple. The, the, the DLL itself has three kind of API calls to, uh, to call those uh, specific plugins as necessary. And here at the top, you can see the uh, command and control servers that actually been used during the attack. You can see this the full URL. By the way, and anyone here can uh, spot any threat or a pattern between those names here? Yes. They are all from June. Good job. Actually, you're going to get a shirt, not only a giveaway. <laughs> yes, that's true. Apparently, uh, those hackers are, um, are fans of Dune. Um, so let's look at the specific DLL used within the Ukraine power grid hack. Uh, the first one was stealing files very important function of, of any Trojan file, or a Trojan malware. Uh, this specific one was looking for private keys, and think about the VPN access, that makes sense. Um, they also tried to store some uh, password and get some system information, and very important portion of the, um, the, the attack was the DLL that responsible for network discovery, because as uh, remember, as I mentioned earlier, at this point they need to start looking for the SCADA network and start exploring uh, how they're going to execute the, st the second stage. Um, also, PSEXEAC, who's, who's familiar with those, is very powerful. Was embedded with that, with that DLL, which allowed remote executions. Okay, so. Basically, uh, when they are establishing uh, a, a foothold within the environment, they now are moving into stage two. A stage two, uh, they're using the credentials in order to disable the UPS system. Just a nice kind of things they thought about. Make sure that after this uh, operation, there's no UPS uh, usable in the environment. The second thing, and that probably took most of the time, is developing the firmware that is very unique to those specific sites. And I can tell you that between the three sites that have been hacked, they had to develop at least two separate firmwares because the sites themselves have been using multiple vendors. And so that probably took time and probably uh, involved them actually setting up a replication or a simulation of the same network uh, they're attacking in their environment. Because like, you know, like we do, we want to create a product, test it, and only then deliver it to the customer, right? That's what they did. Only that this specific customer probably was not happy the product worked as planned. So they're sending the, uh, the, um, the firmware, and at this point, they're ready for the attack. And the attack is going to be simultaneously three things going in the same time. First, they're using the uh, team viewer in order to access remotely to the HMI and flip off the breaker. Now they're using the kill disk in order to remove all evidence and render the SCADA unusable and basically wiping the entire hard drive. And then, in addition to that, they are launching a telephony denial of service, which is uh, which is basically phone calls going into the power grid call center. So people that lost power won't be able to call and report it back, which obviously added more chaos and, and panic. And successfully, they're doing it. And where is it from? June. So the reason, the reason, um, it's from Yun and, and the group that, that eventually this whole, um, kind of operation relates to is called Sandworm, which is this huge creature from Dune that, uh, 
was being treated as a god and 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 the uh, the the history of the group is very interesting and and by the way this is attributed to eyesight uh, which actually um, this couple of uh, search uh, security search uh, uh, companies that work on that but that specific uh, slide is coming in from eyesight and the history shows that that specific group uh, historically is after governments and critical infrastructures, which kind of makes sense. Uh, but why Ukraine? And, and this is kind of my interpretation. Um, actually, my wife is from Russia and I'm from Israel, but we know one of the, uh, we know a little bit about politics and around Europe. And you probably heard about the, uh, the Krim, uh, um, kind of crisis. Uh, Russia is um, in the east trying to kind of pull Ukraine to, to her side, the West European to their side. Um, and to me, this one uh, might be related uh, to the um, this crisis between Russia and Ukraine. So this is a, a timeline of, of the actor and a couple of things to mention here. So first of all, those guys are from Russia. Uh, they are the one who wrote or rewrote Black Energy. And they have uh, managed historically to find multiple zero days, specifically on Microsoft Office, not only PowerPoint, but also uh, Microsoft uh, Word. And uh, they also, um, among their targets, and I think there are a hundred targets, uh, specific hundred tar targets that were investigated that um, are associated with this uh, hacker. Uh, a lot of are from Pol Poland, Ukraine, uh, but also some in the U.S. So no, this is not from the uh, power grid outage. But I guess what I'm trying to say uh, on those photos is that it could have been much worse. Uh, all of those, the, the water facilities, transportation, uh, gas, and even uh, nuclear plants use very similar network structures to the one that was used uh, during uh, the Ukraine power grid hack. SCADA, like I mentioned earlier, is, is something that is is um, implemented all over. And as someone who worked within the SCADA, I know that those are relatively legacy systems. They're using XP or sometimes even older Windows services and systems. They are not being patched because those guys are obsessed about touching their system. They want the production to keep on working. They want the power to be on. So they're um, really shy away from patching those things. And they relatively unaware to the security, um, I would say, challenges, right? And and to me, that's a red flag. Um, what happened here is the power outage for a few hours could have been much worse. So let's talk a little bit about how we can solve that. So specifically, um, as I mentioned, the, the uh, specific vulnerability found within uh, or used within that specific attack can be patched. So this is a, a Microsoft uh, uh, security update that could have blocked that specific hole that, that uh, was used during the attack. And you can see here that they also thank iSight for the investigation. And, and though today you cannot just go and, and execute remote OLE uh, code or remote OLE files. Um, however, that's not the only uh, way uh, someone can uh, intrude into a system, right? There are other vectors uh, you can uh, hide behind installers, you can uh, use other uh, exploits. And so um, just added another reference to Dune. Or you can read the subtitles if you cannot uh, hear that.
guess we can also work. So the sleeper must awaken. So I, I really believe in that change. If you want to make, if you want to improve your security posture, if you want this not to happen, you have to change something, right? That's the definition of insanity, right? If you keep on doing the same thing and expect other results, that's not going to work. And so, um, you know, I'm, uh, we are big advocates in, in trying to help that from a threat intel perspective. Uh, specifically, I came up with the list of, obviously, another pyramid. That's the last pyramid for today, I promise. Um, and I'm, I was trying to look at it, you know, from, from a kind of a network layer perspective. How we can make it better, and specifically talking about that incident and, and the SCADA uh, networks in general. And how we can add layers of security in parallel to maybe add some policies. So the first thing I want to say is that NERC uh, has some policies that the energy, uh, specifically power grid, needs to follow. And the U.S. might be in a better position uh, than that specific one incident. And I think air gapping is, is a great solution for it. But NERC is kind of, it's, it's a regulation. And I'm not sure it's followed 100%. I'm actually sure it's not followed 100% everywhere. Uh, behind that, there's some kind of an awareness and kind of uh, a self-understanding of what layers within your network are the weakest link. And so I kind of looked at it from different levels, data and application level. One thing about HMI, it should be a very black kind of block or, or uh, a set of applications that needs to be in an, an HMI. So application whitelisting might not work everywhere. I think on HMI, it should work because there's very certain specific of application you should know uh, should be there. Other applications shouldn't. Uh, so that's one thing. Enforcement of passwords is obviously uh, always important. And as you saw, it was part of this skill chain, stealing passwords. Segregation of duties. This is very important. Make sure no operation or not HMI has full control on the power grid. You might want even to segregate the, ne the network itself and make sure that you can take off some of the networks if being uh, infected uh, without interfering with the other parts of the network. Look at the um, specific IOCs, indicators of compromise, from that specific event and other events and implement patches that are relevant for those specific vulnerabilities. If you have a specific CVE, that we publish or any other vendors publishing, use those. And obviously, uh, use other indicators like IP addresses and MD5s uh, to, to be used within your firewalls and your endpoints. From an architecture perspective, um, I believe ERGAP is something that should be considered when using uh, those sensitive uh, operation networks. Um, if not, uh, adding a DMZ and adding a higher level, obviously the VPN and, uh, was not uh, secure enough uh, in that specific incident. So make sure uh, you have extra layers of security over VPN. And again, I can tell you from experience that most of the vendors will ask you for a VPN to support the equipment. So, you know, people like from Honeywell or from um, you know, Yakagawa or any of the process automation providers wants to be able to support it and the users wants to be able to get some support from their vendors. But, uh, as a, as a network security guy, you want to make sure that the, there's few levels of, uh, multi factors authentication and, uh, and other security measures. Make sure you back up all the files. Remember what happened after the power outage. The entire files were basically removed. Make sure you have a backup so you can restore back your configurations. Uh, and as I mentioned, try to limit the access, obviously. The last part is more towards the human uh, behavior. And I'm coming also from user behavior uh, um, analytics. And that's most of the time is still the weakest link. Make sure that you train the operators, the users, uh, 
kind of uh, to understand what's to expect in the network and also from an IR perspective, uh, create workflows that not are only relevant for your corporate network but also for your SCADA network. So one of them could be uh, this disconnection of part of the SCADA or moving fast from automatic to manual mode. And finally, um, as a security uh, engineer or threat intelligence engineer, keep on investigating for new Yara rules and new um, snort rules that you can implement within your RDSs uh, and your endpoints. So to summarize, we spoke about the pyramid of pain and we said that it's, the higher you go on the pyramid, the harder it is to provide countermeasures. countermeasures. Uh, we spoke about integrators in general and how those can help us uh, identify the kill chain and specifically in our case, the ICS kill chain. Um, like, like I um, always say, this is just one example in Ukraine. This can happen here, this can happen everywhere, and by the way, it can happen on any type of industry, right? Critical infrastructures is just an example. And so indicator investigation is part of a continuous process threat intelligence uh, needs to, uh, to have within each organization. Uh, and finally, make sure you implement those. The sleeper must awaken. Um, so this is the resources I used uh, during my research, and that brings me to the end of my talk. Thank you. We have time for questions. Any questions at all? Okay. Yes, please. Okay, so the question was, how do we approach serial network based into, um, as, as opposed to IP based? That's a good question. So, the, um, what, what happened today is there's a trend where you, uh, basically encapsulating those serial protocols, the late, le le legacy serial protocols and starting to putting it over IP address. Uh, there are certain additional component of security that you need to do with those, uh, because you cannot keep your network with the same security measures after you move from a serial based into an IP. When you add the IP, you also add potential additional vectors in order to attack the SCADA network. And so um, there are specific products in the market uh, that are aiming specifically to security issues related to um, um, what they call a SCADA over IP. Okay, any other questions? All right, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Everyone, um, just come here. There's a couple of